This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Hey me, aren't you in the wrong dimension? Yeah, but I thought I'd help me with my video on deconvolution. Great, we can talk about PSFs and Fourier transforms and division. Division? That'd be great. I like division. Those fools, they're getting ahead of themselves. They can't talk about division yet. Not until they talk about shapes, specifically circles. Yes, I, Dr. Detail, will show them the coolest thing they've ever seen. Circles. Image processing is all about circles. Welcome to Deep Sky Detail. So what is deconvolution? My counterparts may be planning videos on PSFs, on convolution and division and noise and all this other stuff related to deconvolution, but I'm going to give you the cool stuff. Hi, Dr. Detail. What are you doing here? This is my video. I know, but I was wondering how you're going to introduce deconvolution to them. Well, let me start out by saying Russell Croman did a great explanation a few months ago back on the Astro Imaging channel. Check it out if you haven't already. But I'm going to try to go over things differently. I'm not going to really explain deconvolution much, but rather I'm going back to circle one. You mean square one? No, circle one and circle two, all the way up to circle 40. That's how you get to square one. Now. I am by no means an expert in optics, but over the course of creating AstroSharp, I've learned a few things. I've also got some experience in signal detection theory, which is very much related to ideas in deconvolution. This will introduce the viewers to a thing called frequencies. Okay, show me what's so special about circles. All right, because this channel is all about astronomy, instead of using circles, let's use orbits. Let me ask you a question about space. Assume that all orbits are circular. Also assume that we are looking down at the Earth as it moves around things. In other words, we're seeing a 2D picture of the Earth as it moves. What shape does the Earth make as it moves around things in the universe? Well, let's start with it revolving around the Sun. This should be pretty simple, right? It's a circle. But what about the galaxy? What would it look like? Base, moons revolve around planets. Planets revolve around stars. Stars revolve around galaxies. Galaxies revolve in groups. Groups move around in clusters. Clusters move around in superclusters. It's amazing. So let me ask you again. How does the Earth move around in this 2D plane? Assume there are points in the universe located here. Could it hit all these points? That seems pretty unlikely to me. I didn't ask whether it was unlikely. I asked whether it was possible. Okay, Dr. Detail. Is it possible? Yes. And, and how many orbits do you think I need? What do you mean? Good question. See, if the Earth is revolving around the Sun, that's one orbit. The Sun is revolving around the galaxy, that's the second orbit. That would be two orbits. Orbits can be nested within other orbits. The orbits are connected. Ah, so a moon revolving around a planet, which is revolving around the Sun, which is revolving around the galaxy, is three orbits? Yes. Well, it's probably possible. It's a pretty simple set of 20 points, but you would probably need hundreds of orbits, and it would be pretty difficult to figure out. Well, I have figured it out. Look, here is the last orbit. The end of this line is where the planet or moon will be that needs to hit the points. Watch as it revolves around the object here, and that object revolves around this object and so forth. There are only 21 orbits. Okay, it's done some of them. Holy crap, it's almost, but it will never hit the last. How did you do that? Well, I'm definitely not the first one to figure this out. And Mathologer and 3Blue, 1 Brown have done similar videos. And you can learn how to do this with R or Python code. That's true. And this video sponsor, Brilliant, which you can try risk-free for 30 days, can help you learn math data analysis and programming to make cool visuals like this. 
So I don't know if you know this, but I have a strong background in data analysis and coding in R. R is a good language to learn for statistics, but it's bad for making other things, like standalone programs and such. I've actually been using Brilliant to learn more about coding in Python with the hope of eventually making AstroSharp a Python app, which will be much easier to implement. What's great about Brilliant is that it doesn't just give you information, it makes you apply it with examples. I had no idea that in Python you can concatenate strings by just using a plus sign. Brilliant didn't explicitly tell me that, but I had to guess what the plus sign would do. I got it wrong, but then it showed me the correct answer. I really like this style of teaching. It's simple and effective and makes me think as I'm doing it. You can make a plan for learning at your own pace. Brilliant is one sponsor I feel really comfortable working with because you can try it risk-free for 30 days. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash deep sky detail. You'll get 20% off an annual premium subscription. There's really nothing to lose. Okay, back to circles. That was just a simple set of points. And what does this have to do with image processing and deconvolution? I'll answer that second question in a bit, but you gave me a challenge. Do you think I can make a square shape with orbits? We're getting to square one. That definitely seems harder. I'm going to say it's possible, but there's no way you can figure it out. I'll get a good approximation with only 40 orbits. Whoa, can you explain why this is important for image processing? Just one second. Look at the first example and compare it to the second. What do you notice? Well, in the first example, the innermost orbit follows the square almost perfectly, and they seem to be arranged from largest orbit to smallest. Yep, good job. You're pretty smart. Thanks. Don't get, get cocky. Sorry, I meant I try. That's better. I arranged the second example in a couple different ways than the first. You already pointed out that the orbits are arranged from largest to smallest. That's not super important. It's also not super important to notice that in the second example, all the orbits are synced with the largest orbit. This orbit, for example, makes three orbits in the same amount of time as it takes the largest orbit to make one. But the most important thing is this. I have set it up so that the larger orbits generally make an orbit more slowly than the smaller orbits. So, a year for the smaller orbits is quicker than a year for the larger orbits? Yes, good job. I try my best. A simple thanks would do. I have one more cool example to show you. We'll see if we can get a bunch of orbits to follow this outline of a galaxy. But first, let's talk about Fourier transformations. What? Back in the 19th century, Joseph Fourier made the observation that basically any function can be broken down into a series of sine function? waves. Function? Sine waves? Yes, function, sine waves. Ugh. Okay, let's do a quick demonstration. Look at this website. I'm going to draw a function. It's complex. It would be hard for me to give an exact formula for this, but Fourier thought we could break it down into sine waves. Look, on the right is a sine wave. It is just one but we can add up another sine wave to make it look like this. If we put these on the same scale, and then these two bottom sine waves would add up to the top one. We can take another sine wave and add it to the other two. See how the top one kind of looks like the left one now? No. Oh, ye of little faith. Let's add a lot more sine waves by moving this slider. No way. The top line looks exactly like the drawing on the left. The function on the left. So what you're saying is that if we take any point on this top function, it's just the sum of all the other sine waves at the same point in time? Yes. But what does this have to do with circles and orbits? Well, take a look at this. It's an orbit. Let's track the planet's height over time. I know we're in space and height doesn't make sense, but let's define the height as how high it is on the viewer's computer okay. screen. What do you notice? It looks like a sine wave. Exactly, it looks like a sine wave. So a Fourier transformation can tell us the sine waves that make up a function, like an astrophotography what? image. What? Astrophotography images aren't functions. Is this outline of a galaxy a function? Um, you can think of it as one. 
And you can think of an astrophotography image as a function too. You have the positions of the pixels and the brightness of the pixels. It's complex. And that's why a Fourier transformation is so useful. It tells us about the sine waves. It gives us the frequencies. Frequencies? Yes, frequencies. Let's make the planet orbit faster. Look at the sine wave now. The time it takes to rotate is less. Because of that, the time between peaks in the sine wave has decreased. It has what we would call a higher frequency. But how does that relate to image processing? Back to square one. Take a look at this square again. I've arranged the orbits from biggest to smallest. I've also made it so the bigger orbits rotate the slowest. They have the longest years. The smaller orbits generally rotate faster. They have the shortest years. Big orbits equal low frequency. Small orbits equal high frequency. Now let's examine how it makes an outline of a square. Notice that when it is traveling in a straight line, the high frequency orbits are sort of just moving without any real purpose. In fact, it looks like you could make a square with just two orbits. This second orbit is following the line pretty well, but look what happens when it gets close to a corner. Now it seems like all these little orbits conspire to make the smallest orbit make a sharp corner. So the low frequencies give us the general shape and the high frequencies allow for dramatic changes? Yes, yes, you got it. The low frequencies give general information. The high frequencies give the detail. You are smart. Let's look at the galaxy drawing again. There are only 40 orbits. We are missing some of the high frequency information. As we travel around some of the corners, you can see that the last orbit doesn't quite reach the white line. We don't have enough detail. So if we know what we want the image to look like, we add more and more orbits with higher frequencies using Fourier's ideas? Precisely. Transforming an image into its frequencies, in other words, doing a Fourier transformation on it will be super helpful. If we know how the higher frequencies get lost, we can just add them back into the Fourier transformed image and then convert it back to the normal image. So transforming an astrophotography image into frequency space or doing a Fourier transformation will look like a bunch of orbits like in your examples. No, the examples are simplified to help you get an intuitive feel for what is going on. Here is an astro image, and here is its Fourier transformation. The top part of the transformation tells us about the frequencies of the sine waves of the image. It's sort of telling us how fast the orbits are. The bottom part isn't as important, but it tells us about the phase of the sine waves, or where the orbits start out. The middle part of the image tells us about the low frequency sine waves. The edges tell us about the high frequency. Watch what happens when we destroy the low frequency information by blacking out the middle of the image. It's a jumbled mess. We basically lost all the information in the image. You can barely tell what the image was. Yep. Now let's instead of destroying the low frequency information, let's destroy the high frequency information. I'll go ahead and destroy a good chunk of the high frequency information. <laughs> wow, nothing has really changed. But some of the noise is gone and it's a bit blurrier. Yep. Just like not having quite enough high frequency orbits in my examples. So you could do a Fourier transformation and black out the high frequencies to do noise reduction on your images? Theoretically, yes. But getting rid of high frequencies also gets rid of detail. Which is what deconvolution tries to bring back. Exactly. And I'm sure that you and my other counterpart will do a good job at explaining this in the next video. If you like this video about circles, you should check out this one about two big circles in the sky. It's about how my family and I went to Texas to go see the solar eclipse. Thanks for watching.